Hello, this is Tony Blazer back with another video here for the Motocross Vault. And what I'm going to do with this one is I'm going to cover the awesome 1986 Honda CR250R. Now this is a really great machine. It's a bike that people still love today. They do a lot of restoration projects on it. Probably mostly because Rick Johnson was uh, such a great, had such a great year on it. He ended up taking the 250 Supercross and Outdoor National title on the 86 CR. Uh, they actually finished 1-2-3 in uh, Supercross with uh, David Bailey, Johnny O'Meara, and Rick. So it was a great, great bike. Uh, dominated the standings that year. Um, now, a lot of times people think of the 80s as like the Honda decade, but like every manufacturer, they had ups and downs. Um, 85 was actually not a great year for Honda. Uh, the works bikes that year were super trick, but maybe they went a little too far. They weren't that successful on the track, and the production machines were pretty lackluster. Um, in 84, the CR had been a powerhouse, but it had serious reliability issues. Uh, so Honda in 85 had uh, gone a long way towards trying to uh, keep the bikes in one piece and really mellowed it out. Uh, the 85 bike was a torker, wasn't very fast. Uh, most people really didn't care for that machine that much. The suspension was pretty mediocre too. So for 86, uh, Honda basically threw away everything but the looks. The 85 and 86 bike look very similar, but performance-wise they are completely different. And uh, this is the first year uh, for the production rule, which I'll get into a little bit here in the video. So it kind of, uh, Honda really, really threw everything they had at the 86 CR250 and uh, it paid off. It ended up, uh, like I said, dominating both Supercross and Outdoors um, and even the 500 version took the 500 title with David Bailey. So great, great year and actually Mickey Diamond in the 125. Honda really kicked butt in 86. It was, all the bikes were really good that year. So um, this is the 250 and uh, like I said, if you like this kind of thing, make sure you subscribe to the channel, ding that little bell. Uh, if you're watching here on YouTube, if you're on Facebook, give it a like and share it if you would. I'd appreciate it. And uh, here's the story of the 1986 CR250R. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, one of the most interesting things about the 1986 uh, AMA Supercross and Motocross season was the introduction of the production rule. Now, currently, all motocross bikes that you race here in America on the AMA circuit have to be based on a production machine, meaning the, the frame, the motor, the engine cases, all of them have to be based at least principally on something you can buy off the showroom floor. You can make some addition to the material and frame for strength. You can change some internal parts. The cases have to stay the same. Suspension, of course, is kind of freewheeling. You can't uh, bolt on a say, set of crazy quadrilateral forks like this 82RC 250 had, but uh, you can change the internals out, change the size a little bit, the diameter and stuff. You can see a lot of times they'll run air suspension when the production bikes are fork, or spring forks or vice versa. So there's a little more leeway with suspension-wise, but back in the early 80s, like this 82 here, anything went. Uh, as long as you kept the displacement within uh, the guidelines, you could pretty much race anything. Uh, Honda was kind of the king of this era. They had some really, really exotic machines. Uh, they never really uh, raced this 82 quadrilateral bike in the U.S., but this kind of stuff was uh, par for the course for Honda. They really were pushing it. They had a uh, two-stroke 125 twin. They raced in Japan briefly, although it never really uh, made it uh, on the international scene there. But in, in any case, they, the Honda was spending just an exorbitant amount of money on these bikes. In 85 here, they had a really, really trick machine. As you can see, uh, look at the saddle in this thing. It goes all the way up to the tank. It wrapped all the way around. I mean, it's, it is super advanced. I mean, really, you don't even see a bike quite that looks like this even now. I mean, that, other than the fact that it's a two-stroke, not a four-stroke, that, that machine would not look uh, outdated now. It's really, really trick machine. Uh, they had, like, droop tanks on one side. You can see this one has a tiny little radiator on one side of this RC125 of Ron Lachine. The other side has a much larger radiator. Uh, they went with all kinds of interesting designs all in the pursuit of domination on the track. Now, the problem with that was a lot of the other manufacturers did not have the deep pockets of Honda. Uh, Yamaha, uh, basically Japan was going through a little bit of a recession in the early 80s. Uh, Yamaha decided that it was just too expensive to keep up, and they actually went with production machines, and I think it was 83 was the first year they went with the production machines, but um, they started racing production bikes. Amazingly, Yamaha was still able to capture a few titles, uh, in 84, they got the 250 national title with Rick Johnson on the YZ250 here. And in 85, they actually got the 500 title as well with Brock Glover on a basically a stock YZ490. Now, when you consider what they were going up against with these Ultra Bucks Works Hondas, it's pretty amazing. It's kind of more of a testament probably to the talent of those riders than the performance of the machines. Motocross, of course, being mostly the, the rider is the most important factor, but... Uh, Yamaha was pretty unhappy with the fact that they were being outspin and they couldn't keep up. So they kind of petitioned the AMA to uh, level the playing field a bit. Now, the idea behind it was it would make it more fair for privateers, 
in quotes here, uh, to compete by giving them a fighting shot at having a bike that was at least somewhat close to what the manufacturers were running on the factory teams. But the reality was, uh, I think it was mostly the manufacturers not wanting to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars, millions really, into uh, building these bikes that you know they weren't selling. So in 86, the AMA decided they were going to instill a production rule, which meant, again, as I said, the bikes had to be based somewhat on the machines you could find on the factory floor. Now, at the time, it was thought that, you know, this would really hurt Honda because Honda's bikes were just such a huge advantage in terms of uh, the technology on them. They they were super trick. Uh, they had electric power valves and incredibly slim frames and slim low body work. It was just really trick machines. Uh, so for 86, they had to really kind of pull out all the stops here to try and make the bike more competitive. In order to do that, Honda redesigned virtually everything on the 86 CR250 with the exception of the bodywork. Uh, the bodywork here looks very, very similar to 85. The only difference is the logo on the seat is different. Uh, the shroud decal is slightly different. Uh, the gold rims are kind of the giveaway that the different than the 85. But like I said, the 85, 86, other than graphics, is very, very similar. But everything under the skin is new. Uh, Honda kept the, sa kept the same basic frame geometry, but they added some additional welds to certain junctures on the frame, added a little material there to make it a little tougher, uh, a little less uh, flexy. They also uh, totally redesigned the motor on the 250. Now, this is the first year for Honda's new Honda PowerPort system. Now, what that is, is this is Honda's real uh, first attempt at like a variable exhaust power valve. Uh, when you think about early power valves, they basically come in two versions. There is the variable exhaust port, meaning something that varies the port height or the port shape of the exhaust port. Um, that would be Yamaha's original Yamaha power valve system. Now, in the case of the Yamaha, it used a rotating drum that would uh, slide open and close based on engine RPMs, and it was controlled by an electric centrifugal ball. I'm sorry, by a, a centrifugal ball governor. Um, on the original Honda Works bikes, it was controlled by an electro servo. But for the production version here in 86, uh, they used a centrifugal ball governor again, just like Yamaha was using. It was obviously reliable, not quite as precise, but uh, much easier to produce, uh, more cost effective. Now, in 84, Honda had had their other version of a power valve, which was the ATAC system, which was automatic torque amplification chamber and what this did was vary the volume of the head pipe meaning that um, the shape of an expansion chamber uh, has a lot to do with how the motor runs uh, there's sound waves going through that chamber and the way they are the the chamber shaped affects the sound waves coming out of the motor and it helps it uh, get the exhaust flow out helps the motor run differently based on the length of the head pipe the shape of the head pipe the shape of the pipe itself and what the idea behind the ATAC was, by adding this little chamber off, in the 250's case, it was actually built into the side of the cylinder. On the 125, it was actually a little uh, tank that was off the uh, exhaust pipe itself. Uh, what it would do is allow a little flapper valve would open, allow a little more volume into there at low RPMs, basically tricking the motor into thinking it had a different exhaust pipe on it. And then when it hit a certain point, the governor would close that little flapper valve, allow an unencumbered flow to the exhaust pipe and in that case give it basically you're thinking you'd have like a low end pipe and a top end pipe installed uh, like a gnarly FMF pipe versus like a you know an FMF high RPM pipe basically two pipes in one now this original system worked okay I mean on some applications seemed to do decently and others it really didn't seem to make a whole lot of difference on the 125 actually a lot of people uh, would delete it completely some aftermarket companies made pipes that got rid of the ATAC chamber on the 250 you couldn't do that because it was uh, built into the cylinder itself it was a little more complicated but um, in 84 the bike was super fast actually it worked pretty well it it didn't give it a super wide power band but it was hard hitting and fast uh, but like I said they had some issues with uh, cracking pistons and stuff uh, so for 85 they uh, basically backed all that stuff down a little bit and it ended up uh, having the bike be much more reliable but it uh, had some major issues with uh, lack of power it was a torquer wasn't very fast now for 86 honda went with a system very similar to yamaha's this new honda power port system used a set of sliding guillotine valves uh, that came in from the sides and would cover the exhaust port at low rpms essentially lowering the exhaust port height uh, to give you a little bit more torque uh, meaning at low RPMs with a two-stroke, you're concerned about 
Um, the piston uncovering that port too early and letting some of that uh, gas out, not giving the maximum effect of it. So by lowering the exhaust port height, you give a little more, a uh, little more efficiency at low RPMs. But at high RPMs, when the engine's moving much faster, the piston's moving much faster, you want to have that un uncovered, let it flow a little better. And what would happen is with the centrifugal ball, governor would ramp up, it would pull those little valves uh, out of the way of the exhaust and allow better flow. Now, the downside of this system was it was extremely complicated. Uh, I've had several of these CR250s with this system and a couple of CR125s too, and when it works well, it works very well. It's a very efficient system, uh, but it's one of these situations where it's super complicated and very easy to get wrong. Um, you have to be very careful when you're taking it apart and putting it back together. If you get it out of uh, adjustment, the bike will run terribly. And uh, Honda recommended you actually take this darn thing apart every two hours of use, which was pretty crazy. Um, at the time when Honda was introducing the HPP, they said, you know, the customer was demanding works bike power out of their machine, so they needed to be able to take it, uh, have works bikes maintenance schedule. So you can imagine how people probably felt about that at the time. Now, like I said, I've had several of these. I never took them apart every two hours. I, I never had that get that bad. But if you did, I, you know, every top end job or something, take it apart, clean it, it was okay. It did get a lot of carbon. Um, if you ran, you know, different kinds of oil, sometimes it'd be a less, little less likely than others to do that, but the system worked great, but it was a real pain to service. Now, in addition to the all new power valve system, the 86 CR featured a completely redesigned cylinder, uh, with new porting, slightly higher compression and a all new liner inside. Now, at the time, most motorcycles still were using like an iron liner, and what that meant was it was basically uh, borable. Uh, if you roach the top end or something, you could have honed it out, bore it out a little bit, put an oversized piston in it. Uh, obviously, that was a great deal for reliability. If you did destroy it, you weren't having to buy an all-new cylinder. Uh, but iron wasn't necessarily the best material for heat dispensation. A lot of early motocross bikes used like a chrome liner. My 78 uh, CR250R had a chrome liner. Uh, so they tried some uh, early materials to try and get a little bit better heat transfer. Now for 86, Honda went with a uh, all new material called Nicosil. Now this was a material that had been uh, developed, if I remember right, in the late 60s, early 70s, but it had never been used on production machines to this point. It was a, a material based on a nickel silicon carbide uh, combination, um, and it was extremely hard and very thin. Uh, you could put it on the side of the cylinder, and it allowed excellent heat transfer, and it was allowed for very tight tolerances. Now, the only downside of the Nicosil was uh, if you did damage the cylinder, you had to get a new cylinder, which really sucked. Um, especially early on, it was hard to find places that could retreat it or anything. I'm sure in 86, it probably just didn't exist. Even in 89, when I roached the cylinder, it was hard to find a place. I ended up putting a, a replacement iron liner in my YZ, and it ran terrible, but that's a whole other story. But this early Nicosil stuff was very tricky. It was something Honda had been using on their works bikes for a few years, um, and they added it to the production machine in 1986. Um, this motor turned out to run way, way, way better. Uh, than the 85 had. Um, the engine was super, super smooth. It was a real electric. If you've ever been one of these 86s, they're real electric. It has a, a very, very wide power band. Um, in 86, the Kawasaki was a real torquer. The Yamaha was more of a top-end motor. Uh, the Honda kind of covered all the bases. It was uh, good torque down low, not as brawny out of the holes the KX, but uh, solid, and had a really long, strong pull. The, the HPP motor there was really no place where it wasn't pulling. It, it pulled and pulled and pulled and, and revved really high. Um, it wasn't the out-and-out -out most explosive motor in 86, but it outpowered all the other bikes by a fair margin. It, it put out over 2 horsepower more than any other 250 in 1986, which was a huge advantage. That, Like I said, the bike was both fast and smooth. So out of the box, even without any modifications, it, you already had the fastest motor. So going to uh, the production bike certainly gave them a great platform in 86 to work from. The clutch continued to be excellent. The transmission was super smooth. It was, by most people's uh, accounting, by far the best power plant of 1986. In addition to the excellent motor, the CR had a pretty significant handling advantage in 86 as well. The small chassis changes they made to the 85 uh, really paid dividends. The bike was very, very excellent in the turns. It was by far the best turning machine of 1986. Uh, better than all the machines by a fairly significant margin. Now, the one thing it did do was head shake, though. It had a uh, really nasty set of shakes. Now, 
mainly you would see that when it was coming down from speed. Uh, it was kind of a trade-off, especially in the old days before we had uh, steering dampers on stock bikes or uh, the ultra-stiff chassis we have now with the aluminum chassis and stuff. The, the old bikes, they tended to do one or two things. If you made them turn, then they shook like crazy or they uh, either went straight and didn't turn. So in 86, Honda definitely went for the turning into things, and these things would shake bad enough to rip your handle hand. I'm sorry, rip your hands right off the handlebars. I had that happen several times where I was, I had my chest on the uh, gas cap just praying for uh, dear life to hang on. So the bike, it was pretty uh, pretty gnarly when you started to get tired towards the end of the moto and your hands were going numb and stuff. It could head shake pretty bad and catch you by surprise. But uh, the bike was an excellent handling, mo handling motorcycle. Uh, now certainly some of that credit went to its suspension. In 86, the other thing that Honda did was really uh, open up a can of whoop-ass on the competition by uh, moving to a cartridge fork. Now, prior to 1986, all the forks you would have found on any motocross bike sold, and even some street bikes even now, would be what would be referred to as a damper rod style fork. Now, in essence, what that is is very simply the dampening is handled by drilling some small holes in a rod that goes down inside the internals of the fork and by forcing hydraulic fluid fork oil through these orifices that provides resistance and causes the damping force you feel when you land off a jump or on rebound when the uh, wheels returning now the problem with a damper rod style fork is a couple of things with a fixed orifice damper rod style fork the damping can be both too progressive and too harsh in low speed situations the fork tends to flow too much oil this allows the fork to dive excessively then on sharp impacts and square edge bumps, the damper rod design suffers from a hydraulic locking force. What that is, is it can't flow enough fluid fast enough through those fixed orifices to prevent a uh, spike in the damping. Uh, because the same holes are used for both the slow speed and high speed damping forces, enlarging them to cope with the high speed forces only makes the low speed performance worse. Likewise, making them smaller then to increase damping performance would cause a nasty spike in the damping. They're both too soft and too hard at the same time, and it's difficult to fine-tune them. The other problem is because the oil used for damping is mixed in with the springs, the fluid itself can become very contaminated with air. Um, this is a problem on rebound where you get a lot of aeration in the fork. It causes a frothing of the fluid, and that degradates performance. Now, the advantage of going to a cartridge design is that instead of using a simple set of fixed diameter holes to control damping, it uses a set of bending shim type washers. This design is sometimes called like wave washers or shims. Now these series of shims, which are similar to little wave washers, like I said, are used for the damping force. The shims are stacked up against the face of the piston, and when the oil flows through them, they force the oil forces the shims to deflect away from the piston face. This design allows much better damping control at low piston velocities, which helps prevent fork dive and also allows much better handling and performance on high-speed hits. It's better able to uh, cope with the varying demands of slow, low-speed, low-velocity impacts and high, quick, hard-velocity impacts. Uh, in addition to offering finer damping control, the cartridge design also does a much, much better job of separating the air from the fluid, which prevents the frothing and the degradation of the oil to get it much better and more consistent performance. Um, the cartridge design also allows you to have much finer control of the low and high speed. You can, instead of having just a, one set of holes that has to handle everything, you can have separate uh, valving for low and high speed performance. So it allows you a much, much finer uh, tunability to the fork performance. So it's more consistent with the damping. It has a uh, much broader range of control and it allows you to you know, control the damping and set up the fork much more precisely. Now, Honda had been using this design or a uh, similar function of it since the mid 70s. They on their work spikes, but the uh, the cartridge was considered a very, very expensive and very advanced design. And um, up to this point, obviously, they used damper rods on the production bikes because they were just less expensive. Uh, but with the production rule coming, Honda really figured it was time to uh, let loose the best of their technology. So for '86, they offered the cartridge design forks on the 500 and the CR250 in that year. Now, the 125 still used the damper rod style fork. Uh, it would not get it until 1987. So in '86, Honda had the market the market cornered on fork performance. The CR offered by far the best performance in the class. It was far far less harsh than uh, the the damper rod style forks you would have found in the competition. And uh, basically allowed Honda to take the fork 
win for the first time in their history. Honda had always been known for having pretty subpar suspension. The Shawa components were never that great. Uh, Honda was a part owner in Shawa, so they always kind of stuck with Shawa. But uh, traditionally, KYB offered much better performance in the 70s and early 80s. So uh, this was a really, a really big coup. The, um, the CR did use a set of 43 millimeter conventional. They weren't upside down yet. Uh, forks. Now there was compression damping adjustability on these, but they weren't adjustable for rebound. Uh, rebound would have to wait a couple more years. But uh, in 86, like I said, these were by far the best uh, set of components you could find on any 250 uh, anywhere, really, at that point. Um, really a big advantage for Honda in this year. Outback, the 86 CR used a redesigned ProLink rear suspension system. Uh, the linkage was new for 1986. They also beefed up the swing arm slightly to help fight flex. The shock was a remote reservoir, as you can see here, Shawa unit. This was uh, a year before they went to incorporating the actual reservoir under the shock, piggyback style. Uh, this was the last year they used this hose on the uh, CR250. Now, this shock was considered the best of the 86 pack, but that wasn't saying much. None of them were real great this year. Uh, the shock was a little bit uh, stiff on compression, a little light on rebound. Uh, most people found it kind of a little bit harsh and prone to kicking if you backed out. So it wasn't a great shock. It was probably the biggest detriment in the CR package that year, if you don't count, maybe the head shake. Uh, but again, it was still the best in the class. So suspension design, you know, wasn't always the best in the mid-80s. So uh, the shock wasn't up to the fork standards, but it still wasn't terrible. Uh, but when you combine it with the awesome forks, uh, the CR offered by far the best all-around suspension package in the class. Uh, it wouldn't be another year until everybody else started getting on the uh, cartridge forks. In 87, uh, Suzuki would uh, get their suspension sorted out and add cartridge forks and kind of eclipse a little bit of the Honda's performance. But in 86, they were in a class of their own. Now, when you combine the razor-sharp chassis with the powerful motor, with the excellent forks, it's pretty easy to see why the CR was so dominant that year. It, uh, Like I said, it captured uh, both national the motocross and supercross titles it captured every single shootout in every magazine motocross action dirt bike dirt rider cycle news all of them picked it as the best 250 of 1986 it just was a clean sweep and then if you count uh looks i mean for my money it's one of the best looking motorcycles ever built i love the looks of this bike it is just a phenomenal looking machine so it had the looks it had everything going for it even had little things like the detailing the grips were really really good they are kind of the only grips that you possibly would want to probably keep on the bike if you ever had one of these bikes from the 80s if you had like a han i mean a yamaha or suzuki or something the grips were just terrible they'd chew your hands up these uh, cr grips were kind of like what you would have seen on scott at the time their compounds a little softer and uh, they were actually worth keeping on the motorcycle the bars were steel but they were made of a tough um, chromoly steel and they were much much tougher than like the cheesy butter bars you would have seen on uh, many of the competition they're actually uh, in a handlebar shootout in 1986 they shot them out against like renthals and uh, some of the other uh actually maybe it was 89 because it was i guess the Illumilite was out by then um they actually thought the stock honda bars are actually more uh, uh strong than some of the aluminum ones but um again heavier and what have you the the levers were forged uh, meant you could drop the bike they would bend instead of snapping again if you ever had a yamaha and you drop the darn thing the, the lever would just snap off uh, the CR, you could bend a little bit, bend it back, and it was still functional. Just better put together. A um, couple of the only issues with the bike. Terrible head shake. Uh, the water pumps, you know, after uh, you've had a few years on these bikes, anybody who's tried to restore one of these knows the water pumps get all full of crap. The uh, magnesium that was used in the engine cases corrodes, uh, particularly if you don't use good, high-quality coolant in there, and eventually it'll turn the whole coolant system into a bunch of muck. Uh, but back then it wasn't an issue when the bike was new, of course. Um, the power valve was a pain to surface, a uh, service, but for the most part, the bike was really, really bulletproof, excellent performance, uh, very, very few problems overall. Just one of the best motorcycles of the eighties for sure. In 87, Honda, uh, took away some of that smoothness actually and bumped up the hit to the CR250. Some people liked it better than 86. Some people didn't primarily fast guys. Uh, you lost a little bit of that low end in that transition. And then in 88, they went a little bit too smooth. Uh, trying to get the smoothness back. A lot of people thought the bike actually felt slow that year, but uh, in 89, they'd get that uh, kind of get that sweet spot back they had in 86 and 87 and uh, put the CR back to the front in terms of the performance uh, in the motor class. Uh, the bike itself, like I said, definitely an icon of the 80s. Excellent motorcycle. Uh, bike actually I never owned. I did ride one a couple times. I wish the heck I had owned one. I'd love to have one now, find a nice one, but of course, it's probably hard to find one that's not beat to death. Uh, but it's definitely a bike worth collecting for sure. I mean, anybody who's a Rick Johnson fan like myself uh, probably would love to have one of these things. So, 
In any case, uh, if you like this sort of thing, make sure you check out uh, the other reviews I've done here um, of the Motocross Vault. And I also write for uh, Pulp and Max as well. So you can find a written review. I did a review on this bike about four or five years ago, I guess. I wrote it up for Pulp and Max. There's about 140 of those classic reviews up on the website there at Pulp and Max. So feel free uh, to check those out. Uh, also, you can, uh, if you have some other bike you'd like me to do, feel free to leave a comment below or hit me up on social media. Uh, that address is Tony Blazer, which is at T-O-N-Y-B-L-A-Z-I-E-R. And I do read everything everybody sends to me, so feel free to drop me a line. And like I said, until uh, we meet again, keep the rubber side down and the throttle on.